So as Mark said, my name is Tamsin Fretwell and I work for Plant Life on the Magnificent Meadows Cymru project. So I'm going to talk to you just a really quick overview of the project and then I'm going to talk about what's going on with meadows in Wales, the current situation, why they're important and what the project is hoping to do to reverse the decline in meadows. And then at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can help halt this decline as well. So Magnificent Meadows Wales is a plant life project working in conjunction with the National Trust and the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, and also two of the national parks in Wales and a host of other partners. It's funded by the Welsh Government. It's a three-year partnership project ending in 2022 and it has a Wales-wide scope. It's got meadows in the title but it's about grasslands. We use the word meadows in the title because it conjures something up for people whereas grasslands maybe people feel less attached to grasslands but we are attached to grasslands and it is about grasslands as well. So what's the problem with meadows in Wales? Well it took 6,000 years to create the species rich grassland for which the UK is globally famous Yet in less than a century, we have lost 97% of our meadows and unimproved grasslands. This slide cho shows us the changes in grassland in Wales from the 1930s in the left-hand picture to the 1980s, 1990s in the right-hand picture. So the green and the yellow are semi-improved and semi-natural grassland and the red is improved grassland. So you can see by the 1980s Wales was totally dominated by improved grassland and the semi-improved grassland, the yellow, has almost totally disappeared and the semi-natural grassland has equally almost totally disappeared. But are meadows a natural habitat anyway, I hear you cry? Well, I had the same question myself. Um, I used to work as countryside warden for Conwy Council. And one of the sites that I managed was a calcareous grassland, Munnoth Marion. And I really questioned, why are we trying to keep this hillside as meadow, as grassland, when it really wants to be woodland? If I didn't go and chop the trees down that were growing there, the site would have become woodland over time. And that's the same for pretty much anywhere in Britain. If you have a bare patch of land and you allow natural succession, as this diagram shows, to take place, you will end up with woodland as the final stage of the climax vegetation. So when I was questioning this, I looked into why we should be maintaining grasslands and why they would have been natural originally. And then I looked at the work of Oliver Rackham and Franz Vera, and they both talked about how in forests across the world, where there are still large herbivores, you end up with large natural meadows within those forests, big, glades if you will um, created by large herbivores so it's the same in Britain we would have had these large glades caused by large grazing animals which have long since gone extinct so in the on the slide we've got a picture there of the auroch and we would have also had wild horses and other large grazing animals So why does the loss of meadows matter? Well, all these species rely on meadows. Species-rich grasslands 
are one of our most biodiverse habitats and assemblages of fungi and flowering plants support in turn a rich assemblage of invertebrates, mammals and birds. But it's not all about the flowers. Wales is also home to over half of the UK's waxcap species. There's more than 35 sites in Wales that are of national or international importance for grassland fungi. So why else are species rich grassland habitats important? So there's a number of reasons. Carbon sequestration, the studies have shown that species rich grasslands store a lot more carbon than intensively managed systems. Flood resilience, soils that are, are underneath species rich meadows are much more absorbent than intensively managed grasslands. Conservation, well, we've already talked about that. A fifth of all priority species are associated with grassland habitats. Pollinator conservation, as I'm sure you're all aware, there's been a massive reduction in the number of pollinators and flower rich grasslands are really important in supporting high numbers and the diversity of pollinating insects. Sustainable farming. So species rich pastures and hay results in healthier animals and healthier food. There's a lot of research that indicates that grass fed species rich pasture animals um, are a lot healthier for you. Landscape. Surviving meadows are key landscape features like ancient woodlands and people. The colour and wildlife of meadows enriches our lives, giving us a sense of well-being, heritage and connection with nature. So how to turn the tide? This is where Magnificent Meadows Cumbri comes in. There's definitely and enthusiasm and excitement about meadows out there. I feel like the project is riding the crest of a wave. There's a lot of people who are super excited about meadows and want to get involved and to help out. So our project has three main areas. There's the Meadow Academy, Meadow Makers and Our Meadow. So I'm just gonna talk really briefly about each of these and then I'm going to go into more detail on the work that I've been doing. So Meadow Makers, this is about support and advice for creation, restoration and sustainability of species rich grassland. We're working with the National Trust on restorations, community meadows, donor meadows, meadows groups and meadows advice hub, which will be an online tool on the Farm Life website. Meadow Academy, this is about provision of training and resources for a wide range of audiences, meadow creation, management, wildlife identification. So this is aimed at a wide range of audiences and covers fungi, plants, invertebrates, habitat creation and management. Unfortunately, quite a lot of this work has had to change because of COVID and so stuff has moved online. Um, I will tell you later on about some of the work that's um, upcoming, but last year um, we trained a whole bunch of people across Wales who were keen fungi people. Um, we sort of trained them up to the, the next level in wax cap identification. And those people have carried on recording and then um, submitting their records to Cobnod in North Wales and to the local record centres in South Wales. Um, and they formed a Facebook group and they're sharing their findings. So that's brilliant. So our meadow, this is about wider engagement to promote inclusivity, accessibility and well-being in relation to grassland environments. The key outcomes are Delivery of wellbeing programmes at three key locations across Wales, 
one of those will be in North Wales, definitely. Um, we have one in South Wales, the third is yet to be decided. There's a wider programme of wellbeing related activities across Wales, some art based community engagement. So the story so far, this is where I'm going to talk to you about what I've been up to in the last year. So I'm going to start with Community Meadows. The project has as a target starting new and helping existing community meadows. So one of the sites that I've been working with um, is Llysacoid and Llamabacha, which is a housing association site. So I was aware of North Wales Housing Association and how they own a lot of land across North Wales. And I had a meeting with them last winter with the aim of persuading them to meadowify some of their grounds around their buildings. And actually they didn't take any persuasion at all. They were super keen and wanted to trial it at this particular site, um, which is a sheltered housing site. And if it was successful there, they're keen to roll it out elsewhere. So I went and visited and took a picture on the left in February. I could see lots of interesting grassland species in rosette form. They're just waiting to have a chance to escape from the mowing regime and grow taller. So my plan was to give a PowerPoint presentation to the residents and see if they would be keen to have meadows around their buildings. <clears throat> Unfortunately, because of COVID, that talk never happened. Fortunately, because of COVID, the meadow happened anyway. Um, the gardeners were furloughed for a few months and in that time, this beautiful meadow sprang up on the right hand picture. You can see lots of oxeye daisies there. It was just a mass of daisies. It looked absolutely stunning. Um, Lucy, the gardener there, when she came back, she mowed these lovely lip edges and some pathways through the site, through the meadow, so that the residents could have access. The residents were really, really happy with the meadow and then um, took lots of photos and just really enjoyed having it there, <clears throat> especially as they were confined to barracks. And um, this was a real lovely place for them to be able to get out into. So the North Wales Housing Association were really happy and um, they've asked me to help them out with several other sites. So that's really exciting. Because uh, as I mentioned, they do own a lot of land, so really positive. Um, another group that we've been working with is um, Dolai Bach. <clears throat> community meadow in Borth. There we paid for them to have a new kissing gate at their site um, because the site's being grazed for the first time for many years. They're a really interesting and exciting project. They've taken on land that was owned by the community council uh, managing it as meadow. My skerchen banger, so I've um, been to several meetings there and it's looking like um, there's a possibility to turn some of these large mown grassland areas into meadow. Um, I've been working with the councillor there, Nigel Pickervance, uh, at the um, play park and that's a brand new play park going in and there's lots of bare earth just ready for meadow seed. So um, I'm, I'm gonna be working with local kids to get the meadow seed spread. And we're having interpretation panels telling them about the different flowers. Uh, hopefully the children will be involved in the design of those too, so that's great. And then another site that we've been working with is Kaya Doll in Tlamperes. <clears throat> so the project has been working with Kaya Doll, um, helping to fund some interpretation panels and some boardwalks there. So I'm going to play you a short video about Kaya Doll. I 
I'm here at Caerdol Community Meadow by Llanberis in Gwynedd in Northwest Wales. And I'm here to meet Robbie Blackhall Miles, who started the community group. Hi, Robbie. Hi. So, how long has the group for India Caerdol been managing this site? So we've been managing it for between seven and eight years, mostly near to eight years. We manage it in conjunction with Gwynedd County Council and Paddock Country Park, although we do do most of the management of the site. And that is not a huge amount of work. Uh, so we cut it once a year, sometimes very late in the year or very early in the year. And we do some stuff like pulling dock and making sure that the marsh rackle doesn't take over in the end. Why did the group take on management of the site? So the meadows here on the edge of Flint Paddon used to be really heavily raised by both sheep and horses. Uh, the horses became quite aggressive towards members of the public. This has got a public right of way going right across the middle of it. Uh, and that public right of way takes all of the tourists in Flint Paris across to the National State Museum. So it could be quite busy here at times. So to have aggressive horses on the site was no good. When the grazing came off, we noticed that there was a few really interesting wildflowers appearing. Um, things like sneezewort, devil's bit scabious, which given how heavily grazed it was, was really surprising. That's when I started chatting to a few members of the community about how we could best move forward making sure that this area of land was looked after. And have you noticed through the management that you've been doing an improvement in the site, in the species richness? And Absolutely. When we very first took on the site, we did a species survey. And we found that there was on average about eight vascular plant species per square metre. A couple of years ago, we did a similar survey. And we found in some areas of the site, over 30 vascular plant species per square meter. So we've had a huge impact from some very simple management techniques. Well, that's really impressive. So what, what have you done that's, that's made such a difference? The first thing that we did was we brought in a cutting bridge. We don't have any grazing on the site, although there is some incidental grazing from sheep that managed to get in here in the winter and spring, which is okay by us because actually it can do with a bit of grazing. But we can't have heavily grazing on here, and certainly not kept a third method of grazing. Is that because of public? Because of public access issues. There's no gates on the site anymore. If I wanted to put cattle on here, I'd probably have to put up a system of electric fences in place, and we would need things like a corral so that we can move the cattle about, which starts to put some infrastructure on the site, which is quite difficult. So, cutting it is. That happens, as I say, once a year. We would like it to be a little bit more than that some years. Um, it would really help in reducing the number of grass species on the site. But also we'll do some stuff like dog pulling. So initially, because of the infertility of the site, there was a lot of dog net on the site. And we have people like Kath Wills, who's above it, one of our volunteers, that comes down here and diligently pulls all of the dock flower heads each year. The amount of dock that we get has vastly reduced because of it. Wow, so you're not digging them up, no, just, just taking the heads the off. Heads. We also have some problems with marsh rankle, which although it is a native species, has the ability to be a bit of a thug on a wet meadow like this. So we do keep an eye on that. We've not had to pull it yet. Um, but every year we have a little look at the amount of marsh ragwort plants there are and whether they're going to cause any problems with pushing out any of the other species on the site and review it. We do some, have some Himalayan balsam here because we're right next to water. We get rid of that pretty quickly and there's a whole team of villagers that as soon as they see a Himalayan balsam plant in the flower, that's it, it's gone. Going back to the grazing, we cut the meadow on a um, patchwork 
and of course, so we don't cut every single bit of the meadow every single year. It does leave some challenges in so much as we get regenerating willow and regenerating scrub on the site. But what it also does is it creates a safe haven in the site for um, wildlife here and it reduces the costs. So we're not cutting all of our 2.01 hectares every single year and as such who pays for the cutting we raise money each year to do it um, we don't have to raise very much it costs about 600 pounds each year to have the whole thing cut we don't nail uh, we dump power risings into our wooden scrub line which is a really important habitat in its own right and those risings also become an important habitat in their own right too in fact, every winter when um, it's pretty bleak here, the warmth coming off the piles of risings is really, really nice. Um, and we see loads of activity, animal scats, so otter, we see otter scat, we see polecat scat, we see lots of birds and things like dogs and mice and those kinds of things. So, you know, actually, to be able to do that and to know that we've got a place in the field and the bugs that's brilliant. So the story so far. Whoops. This is where another part of the project is the well-being element. And we chose Bangor as a one of the pilot sites for the wellbeing project. So the idea is to have a walk that goes from a Sputty Gwynedd to North Wales Wildlife Trust site, Aethenog. And it's a walk that is aimed at staff and some patients, the more mobile patients and long-term patients at a Sputty Gwynedd. So that project is trundling along at the moment. Um, part of the project, um, the idea would be that the patients would start the route in the Spitigwina and would walk through some lovely grasslands on the site. So I went to look at the grass areas at Spitigwina and it was obvious to me that there were lots of different grass and species there hidden away amongst the grass. I counted about 16 different grassland species. And in fact, I talked to Hilary Kehoe from Pont and she said that in the 1980s, she was working there taking a hay crop before, before the hospital was built. So we know it's been managed as a hay meadow for some time. Um, so I was approached by a doctor in the hospital um, Lisa Hancock, who was super keen to make the site more biodiverse, and she managed to get me a slot talking to the management board of Betsy Cadwallader, which was pretty intimidating going in and talking to this management board of about 20 people. So I talked to them about the biodiversity benefits of meadows, but also about the health benefits and um, why it would be good for both patients and staff to have meadows on site. And this is a little bit of the presentation I gave, is the picture of a spadiguina with some superimposed meadow flowers on it. And the board were super keen and said, yes, let's go for it. A few misgivings, but generally the board were really positive and they said if it works at us Bertie Gwynedd let's roll it out across the Betsy Cadwallader Health Board which is seven hospitals across North Wales so that's really exciting and um, I thought brilliant job done but it turned out to be a bit more complicated than that and then of course there was a spanner in the works you know what came along and everybody has been working on COVID since. So Meadows have sort of taken a back stage um, and I was thinking, oh, it's just not gonna happen. 
But luckily, um, a very nice man who works in logistics in the hospital, Tristan, has decided that he's going to take it on as part of a project management course that he's doing. He needs a, um, a deliverable project, so he's decided he is going to make the meadows happen. So that's absolutely brilliant. Um, as part of this work, in order to try and persuade people in the hospital that meadows were the way ahead, because um, I had quite a lot of dissenting voices, um, I made this little video um, at the NRW offices with Stuart Smith, the grassland ecologist. Um, the NRW offices are about 200 metres away from Aspetiguaner. And so I thought it would provide a really brilliant opportunity to show people this can work. We don't need to bring in seed. It's not, it doesn't need to be expensive. It's just a matter of changing the mowing regime. So I'm just going to play you a bit of the Stuart Smith video. I'm here at the Natural Resources Wales offices in Bangor in Penrose Garnerth and I'm here looking at their amazing meadow. I've never seen so many orchids, just so beautiful. Okay, so um, I'm here with Stuart Smith, who's the grassland ecologist for Natural Resources Wales. And um, Stuart's sat amongst these beautiful orchids. Stuart, when you have a look around at this area outside the offices, how does, what, what do you think about it? Well, it's just a fabulous thing to have, really, at, at, you know, the office I work in. So, you know, you come in every day and park your car, and first thing you see as you get out of your car is a lovely scene like this if you're in the summer. So it's just, it's just a beautiful scene, really. How did the meadow get to look so beautiful? What what was the management process? Did you, I mean, I've heard about people stripping turf and getting seed. How did, did you do all of that here? Well, we were pretty lucky actually, because we've not done anything like that. We basically, the building here was built in about 1980. And um, there must have been some areas of sort of wildflower uh, left, left behind from the old uh, fields that used to be here, just some old pasture land. And so, Nobody realised it was here for years, and then when NRW moved into the building, or CCW as it was then, um, people started looking around saying, well, actually, there's quite a few flowers here. And so we then changed the management. Uh, we um, basically don't cut uh, the meadows for about six months of the year, from March until October, and we just let everything grow up in that time, and this is what you get. Basically, so then when October comes, we start cutting, um, and then we keep it pretty short over the winter time. And then, as I say, so once um, April comes along again, we we just let it grow up like this. So and it's, we've not done anything else. Do you never brought in any seeds from no, anywhere no else? Seeds been brought in. I mean, some things probably came here by their own on their own accord. Some of the orchids, for example, because orchids have very small seeds, tiny seeds that can blow around in the wind. So we assume that some of those have come in on the wind, but most species would have probably been here anyway, you know, very small amounts, but gradually expanded. So Stuart, do they take the, the cuttings off after they've mowed? Yeah, so it's cut in, in October, early October like this, and, um, and then the cuttings are left for about a week. Um, so then any seeds in the cuttings can then sort of drop down into the sward. And then the cuttings taken off and they're basically dumped in, in, a, in a sort of shady corner somewhere. And then from then on, every time cut, uh, the sward is cut over the winter, they again then remove the cuttings. Because what you don't want is sort of cuttings left here that will kind of smother the grasses. And, and, uh, mm. and um, did it take... Many years, I mean, did it look horrible for a few years? 
it never looked horrible. It was always, um, you know, there was always a few flowers here and, um, you know, even a bit of long grass could look quite nice. And so, but it, it, it's definitely a lot more species rich now than it was. Uh, but yeah, straight away that we, you know, when we started to go, you know, stopping the cuts through the summer, it, it, looked, it looked nice straight away, really. Wow, that's brilliant. Mm. And um, out of all these beautiful flowers that we've got growing here, are there some species that are more exciting than others? Yeah, well, we have uh, four species of orchid here for a start, so they're always you know, quite interesting. And the, the one we've, I've got in front of me here is the common spotted orchid, which is uh, uh, relatively common. It's probably the, one of the commonest orchids in Britain. It's still nice to have it. But we've got uh, three other species that are less common. We've got bee orchids, um, a northern marsh orchid, and also the great butterfly orchid, which we're particularly proud of. Um, we've so far only had two great butterfly orchids, but um, one over there, but it's just unfortunately just sort of going over now. It's getting a bit late for it. And it's really nice to have them. We don't know how they got here. Again, you know, as I was saying, with orchids, the seeds are very small, so they may have blown in. Um, but, um, you know, the, certainly with the common spotted orchids, they get more and more each year, so it's just beautiful to see them. Yeah. Another, so oh, I've also been yeah. working with well school being. element, um, and in order to turn some of the areas out. Sorry. So I've also been working with schools and in order to turn some areas outside schools into a species rich grassland. So I've been working with Escoffan Shaw in Llandidna. Um, we're going to be turning this rather sort of scruffy area into meadow. Um, Escoffan Shaw, if you don't know it, is a really amazing school where they have their own beehives and they're super interested in nature. And these children have been involved from the beginning in discussions about where would make good meadow and how to go about it. So that's been really interesting working with the children and the head. And then Eskol Glankegin in Maiskechen has a school eco club and they have a really lovely area uh, banks, long banks that could potentially make really great meadow and just need to change the mowing regime. So that's really exciting as well. So another stream of work is meadows groups. Meadows groups are um, a group of people who get together in order to share knowledge, support each other in maintaining or managing meadows. They share seeds, green hay, sometimes livestock, sometimes machinery, sharing contacts and also spreading the word about meadows. The groups vary. So um, there's a number of groups across Wales at the moment a lot more in South Wales than in North Wales. Um, Monmouthshire is a really amazing group. They've got an incredible website. They own livestock, they own machinery. They have published books. Um, yeah, so they're the sort of prototype, I suppose. Not that every group would want to be like the Monmouthshire group, but um, yeah, they're, they're a very impressive group. Um, there's Carmarthenshire, um, who are a much more recent group. Um, they don't own machinery or livestock, but it's about sharing information and knowledge and contacts. Pembrokeshire, my colleague in South Wales, Claire Flynn, is um, helping to set up a Pembrokeshire Meadows group at the moment. Um, Ceredigion Meadows group kind of just about exists, but um, is so it still has a website, I think, but it's um, kind of struggling to survive. So Claire's going to be helping to reinvigorate that group. 
Clean Meadows Group um, was started not long ago by Joe Porter, and um, she has um, started. It's fairly small at the moment, but they've got really involved with um, sharing livestock and um, working a lot with the National Trust. Um, I think the National Trust has helped them out with sharing machinery as well. Um, but yeah, I think that group, it's been a lot about um, putting um, smallholders and people who have small meadows in touch with local farmers in order to share livestock. Um, so I have just started the Anglesey Meadows group in conjunction with Cullum Sadial, which is a project run out of Mentamon. We've had two meetings so far and they've been really interesting and um, we've got I think something like 25 people on the mailing list so that's exciting that that's happening and, um, and there's definitely interest there so we're looking to grow the group and in the future my role will disappear and the group will hopefully be self-sustaining and then um, in Conwy and North Gwynedd we have Kate Gibbs group from um, Kate Gibbs um, who's a trustee of the Wildlife Trust and um, that group is more about information sharing and visiting each other's sites to gain knowledge about meadows and I think Kate's been running that for a few years and then in Northeast Wales, there's currently no group, but I'm hoping to help to start a group, possibly working with the North Wales Wildlife Trust who are super keen and interested and also the area of outstanding natural beauty has a grazing project and they are similarly keen to help out. So hopefully that will happen soon. Um, both the Northeast Wales Meadows Group and the Anglesey Meadows Group, I had so village hall meetings booked for the spring and obviously they didn't happen so um the northeast wales group is um and um, postponed at the moment and the anglesey group has happened via zoom which isn't ideal in some ways i mean it means that people don't have to travel so so it has that benefit but it's quite difficult i think for the group to start without that human interaction so lockdowns willing our next meeting will be outside so that people can actually meet other human beings i mentioned previously that um, part of the project is about training so i thought it would be good to mention to you that we have a introduction to grassland fungi course coming up I'm not organising it, it's our conservation officer, Lucia, who is, is organising this. It's a free online webinar and it's on the 16th of October. The details are on Facebook and um, you, can, you can join it via Facebook or um, you can go on the Plant Life website. So this brings me to what can you do for meadows? So I just wanted to emphasize that any meadow, however small, is brilliant and is way, way better for pollinators and very short grass with no flowers in it. So this tiny little patch of daisies, even though it's really small, it's better than what was there before. So anything you do, is really really good if all you've got is a window box filled with native flowers that's brilliant it's better than what was there before best is to use local plants um, because our pollinators are you know have, have evolved co-evolved with our native plants so it's best to use native if you can and to use local if you can so unfortunately there are no suppliers of native local wildflower seed as yet in North Wales and um, 
there's a few people who are hoping to, to do that in the future, but at the moment it's not, it doesn't, there is no supply. So the, the best option is to go and hand gather seed from somebody else's meadow or to use green hay from somebody else's meadow. Alternatively, depending on your site, you might want to just see what comes up. So in quite a few of the meadows that I've shown you tonight, um, there's already lots of grassland species there. It's just about allowing them to come up. So um, if you have a site that um, has been um, turned into uh, intensively managed grassland, rye grass, for example, um, You'll, you'll need to introduce seed or green hay. But for, for many of us, if it's just a garden or if it's a field that has never been improved, it's just a matter of changing the mowing regime and seeing what comes up over time. Um, meadow creation isn't an instant art. You need to have some patience often, um, but it will happen over time. So I thought I'd just share with you the methodology for um, changing the management in order to get a, a meadow in, in somewhere where it doesn't need um, green hay or seed. So the, the, the management would be to shut up the, the site, um, to have no mowing or grazing if it was somewhere that had grazing animals between March and September. So no mowing, no cutting, no grazing from March to September and then cut and collect in late August, September, either bail it or create a habitat elsewhere with the arisings. It could just be a large heap in the corner. The important thing is to take the arisings off. Keep it short from October to February by mowing or grazing, removing the thatch and the clippings. And then the cycle starts again next March with the meadow being shut up or not mowed. And over time, this will favor the meadow flowers. The one seed that you might like to introduce um, if it doesn't appear naturally in the first couple of years is yellow rattle. This plant is called the meadow maker and yellow rattle um, is semi-parasitic so it tends to reduce the number of grasses and um, allows the meadow flowers to, to, to dominate the sward. So that's the end of my talk and um, I'll take any questions. Thank you.